everyone. Which one still that way? Thank you for being here. We are still, um, have, there's still a few that have RSVP that aren't currently here, but we'll just let them come in and if you see a name tag and a person, we might hold it up so they'll know which table to go to or whatever. So uh, hopefully, yeah, they'll find the place and everything. So again, I want to say a welcome. Thank you for coming to our 2019 Student Managed Investment Fund presentation. Hello there. Sorry, you're right on the screen. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, I know that um, you have lots to do in your day and certainly taking time out to listen to our students and hear their presentation is uh, a great opportunity for them and for us. We really appreciate it. So what I would like for us to do is to have the students make the presentation first and then we'll save our questions for the time while we're eating and getting our food. Some of us have class at one o'clock, about four of us in this room, or five maybe. So we will try to stay with our schedule and be finished by 12.45, that's the plan. So if you would like to go ahead and have your salad while the students are presenting, go for it. If you'd rather wait, then we'll certainly have plenty of time when they finish the presentation to uh, enjoy our meal that's been prepared for us. So, without any further introduction, I'll ask Autumn Lupani to come forward and she's going to do our economic overview. Good morning, everyone. My name is Autumn Lupani, and today I will be giving a brief overview of last year's economy as well as a short economic outlook for 2019. According to the U.S. Bureau Labor of Statistics, Unemployment rose by 0.2% in December 2018 to 3.9%. The jobless rate was high in January with 4.1%, while it remained low during the month of September to November with 3.7%, which was nearly a 50-year low. The U.S. annual inflation rate decreased to 1.9% in December from 2.2% in November 2018. In January, it was 2.1%, whereas in June, it rose to 2.9%, but decreased in December to 1.9%. Throughout 2018, the Fed pursued a policy of higher interest rates and retiring debt, which began reducing inflation in mid-2018, but also saved the stock market tumbling in the fourth quarter of 2018. The labor force participation rate defined as the percentage of people in the civilian population who are either employed or are actively looking for a work in the U.S. for December 2018 was 63.1%. The U.S. economy grew by 4.1% in second quarter of 2018, which was the fastest growth of rate since 2014. The U.S. real GDP, which measures U.S. productivity, saw growth of 2.9%, for 2018, the economy especially grew in the third quarter with 3.4% growth in real GDP, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The increase in real GDP in the 2018 reflected the positive contributions from non-residential fixed investments, exports, personal consumption expenditures, private inventory investments, and government spending. Consumer spending was at a rate of 14.2 trillion as of the fourth quarter of 2018. Consumer spending made up 68% of the U.S. economy. Many experts say that 2018 was one of the crucial years in the housing market. The factors that affected the housing market was tight inventory and high home prices. Affordability pressures affected demand in 2018 which was compounded by rising interest rates. The housing price growth measurably slowed during the second half of the year as compared to the first half. According to the World Bank, global economy grew by 3.0% in 2018. The Eurozone saw a 10-year fastest growth rate of 2.5% in 2017. However, the Eurozone economy stopped to its lowest pace in four years 
in the final three months of 2018. In 2018, the Eurozone expanded, economy expanded by only 1.8%. Emerging Asia is expected to see a medium term growth contingent of trade momentum and domestic reforms. Furthermore, as a result of the increase in technological advancement in manufacturing and service industries, the GDP of Emerging Asia are expected to grow at an annual average of 6.1% from 2019 to 2023. So what can we expect this year? One of the presenters in Global Panel in New York said, corporate <coughs> has been a stellar and economy will grow about 2% in 2019. China has drastically reduced its <coughs> soybean from the US while planning to boost its imports from Brazil and Argentina. Certain presenters in the panel expect that there is a 30 to 35 percent chance of recession in 2019. <coughs> Meanwhile, the geopolitical climate between the current administration and the world powers such as China for trade is cause for concern with many transfers. <coughs> the US GDP is expected to slow to 2.1% in 2019 from 3% in 2018. The factors contributing to projected slowdowns are Trump's economic policies, which includes trade war. The Federal Open Market Committee raised the Fed fund rates to 2.5% on December 19, 2018. It does not expect to increase this interest rate for the foreseeable future. Experts predict that the housing market in 2019 will be characterized by continuing, continued rising mortgage rates and sourcing millennial demand. From policy years by the Fed to the trade war by Trump to slowing growth to slowing global growth, companies everywhere will be more cautious on their spending in 2019 and beyond. Now to start with portfolio overview. Hello, my name is Scott Halper, and I am a portfolio manager for Centenary Institute Management Investment Fund. I'm responsible for the large capitalization portion of this fund. With me today are Blake Smith, Arpana Nupane, Alexis Messina, and Aaron Rostra, who are responsible for the international, mid to small cap, fixed income, and alternative portions of this fund respectively. The college's investment policy states that we are only allowed to invest in ETFs and mutual funds. As you may remember, the Smiths started back in 2004 with an initial gift of $100,000. Since then, $25,155 has been given to the Student Action Investment Fund, and $72,243 has been distributed from the fund to the college. In the beginning of 2018, the Student Action Investment Fund sold some of its holdings in Selected American, Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund, Roy Special Equity, iShares Residential Real Estate Fund, Energy Select SPDR Fund, Guggenheim S&P 500 Equal Weight Technology Fund, and Vanguard Consumer Staples Index Fund. The Smiths also purchased shares in Wasatch Core Growth Fund and Dodge and Cost Fix Income. Please turn to page two. Our portfolio value decreased from $190,042 to $165,843. The fund did give a donation of $12,500 to the school for, uh, to donate to the North Louisiana Angel Fund in Trooper. But a bad end to the year in the market led to a decrease in the Smith's overall value. Please turn to page three. The largest percent of holdings put in the Smith is in the large capitalization portion at about 38.5% of our holdings with fixed income being our next largest area holdings at about 27.08%, uh, with international alternative both having between 12 and 13%, and our smallest holdings being mid to small cap at about 9%. Since its inception in April of 2004, the Student Management Investment Fund of Centenary College of Louisiana has a return of 128.27%. Over the past year, portfolio had a return of negative 6.31%. A representative benchmark needs to be used in order to have a fair comparison for our fund. 
As such, the fund uses a benchmark that is 55% S&P 500, 30% MSCI EFA, and 15% Barclays Aggregate Index. The benchmark had a return of negative 4.48% last year, meaning that our fund underperformed when compared to the benchmark by about 1.83%. With percentages of holdings in mind, my peers and I will try to explain over the course of this presentation why we missed the benchmark. However, it's also important to remember that missing our benchmark does not necessarily mean that we had a bad year as a fund. Benchmarks are meant to be hard to meet. With that in mind, let us start by discussing the large capitalization portion of Centenary College of Louisiana's Student Management Investment Fund. In the large cap segment of our investment fund, we currently hold two ETFs and three mutual funds. We judge success of our funds based off of the benchmark that we use. Since all of the funds in the large capitalization portion are majority stocks, we use the S&P 500 as a benchmark for all. The beginning value for this past year in the large capitalization segment was $72,554, and our ending value was $63,839, with a 2018 return of negative 12.01%. About 67% of our holdings are in the, in the large cap segment are passively managed, leaving about 33% in actively managed funds. Please turn to page four. Our first mutual fund is Selected American, also known as SLASX. This is a large growth, uh, a large blend fund that is fairly representative of the overall stock market in size, growth rates, and price. For 2018, the benchmark was negative 4.38%, and SLASX had a return of negative 14%. Selected American does not beat the benchmark in any cumulative or annualized returns, being about 10% lower than the S&P 500 this past year. Selected American holds mostly U.S. stocks, with their largest holdings being in the financials by over two times the next biggest sector. Financials experienced a rough end to the year because there is concern that the, year, that the yield curve is flattening, with some even believing that it is already inverted, which tends to be a leading indicator for a recession. The large percentage of financials that, that SLASX holds is significantly higher than the, than the holdings in the financial sector and than the S&P 500. While it has consistently underperformed compared to the benchmark, Selected American has returned just over 137.7% since being purchased in April of 2004. Please turn to page 5. Our next mutual fund is Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund Investor Shares, otherwise known as VDIGX. This fund, similar to Selected American, is large blend and has similar goals. For 2018, the benchmark was negative 4.38%, and VDIGX had a return of 0.18%, beating the benchmark by about 4.5%. This fund has generally been near the benchmark historically, and with most of its holdings in industrials, consumer staples, and healthcare, it offers us some diversification within the large capitalization portion of this fund, as its largest holdings are in different areas than Selected America has. Since being purchased in May of 2016, <coughs> Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund Investor Shares has returned just under 22.5%. Please turn to page six. Our next fund in the large capitalization portion is our last mutual fund, which is T. Rowe Price Blue Chip Growth Fund, also known as TRBCX. This is a large growth fund. Its objective <coughs> is to target stocks with potential to grow faster than other large stocks, than other large cap stocks, in the, uh, by targeting rapidly expanding industries. Roughly 50% of the stocks in this fund are in the consumer discretionary and technology sectors. For 2018, the benchmark was again negative 4.38%, and TRBCX had a return of 2.01%, with the fund being the benchmark by about 6.4%. This fund has consistently been a winner. As it, has, as it has historically beaten the benchmark in the past as well. Since being purchased in May of 2016, the fund has returned 47.12% for Centenary Student Action Investment Fund. Please turn to page seven. <coughs> Our first ETF is iShares S&P 500 Index, 
also known as IVV. This fund has almost 99% of its assets in domestic stocks, most of which are large or giant cap stocks. The objective is to have similar weightings for all of its stocks to the S&P 500 in order to reduce risk. For 2018, the benchmark was negative 4.38% and IVV had a return of negative 4.5%. These returns are as expected, since the ETF is meant to be representative of the S&P 500, being off by only a few basis points. Since being purchased in April 2004, iShares Core S&P 500 ETF has had returns of 166.59% for the Student Managed Investment Fund of Centenary. Please turn to page eight. Our last fund within the large capitalization portion of the Student Managed Investment Fund is another ETF, Vanguard Value Index Fund ETF shares, also known as VTV. This fund has, similar, has very similar objectives when compared to IVV. However, since it is a value fund, they try to invest in less expensive, more risky assets in hopes of beating the S&P 500 by larger amounts. As an ETF for the S&P 500, it is still representative and accurately tracks the S&P 500, though there is expected to be a greater variance from the benchmark than, iShares S &P, than the iShares S&P 500 ETF would have. For 2018, the benchmark was negative 4.38%, and Vanguard Value Index Fund had a return of negative 5.4%, underperforming compared to the benchmark by just over 1%. Since being purchased in May of 2010, this ETF has returned just over 25%. It is my recommendation for the large capitalization portion of the Student Management Investment Fund that we sell some, if not all, of our holdings in Selected American and move those funds to T. Rowe Price Blue Chip Growth Fund. While the 137% uh, since, uh, return since inception may be appealing, iShares ETF S&P 500 has returned 166.59% in the same time period. When we met with some of our advisors in March, we were encouraged to consolidate our holdings. As such, I recommend moving our funds from a mutual fund that has consistently been under the benchmark in Selected American into a fund that has consistently been a winner and beaten the benchmark in T. Rowe Price Blue Chip Growth Fund. Thank you guys very much for your time. And next we will have Arpana Nupame discuss the small to mid cap portion of our fund. I'm the portfolio manager for a mid to small cap fund. The Smith currently owns three assets in the mid to small cap category. The Janus Henderson mid cap added funds, the prime cap ODC aggressive growth fund, and the Wall Street core growth fund. A deeper look into the individual funds should explain our performance compared to the Russell 2000. As you may recall from the past history, our Smith investment policy requires us to use S&P 500 as, in, as benchmark, but we use Russell 2000 as benchmark for evaluating the performance of mid to small cap companies. Now please turn to page nine. Our first fund is Janus Henderson Mid-Cap Value Fund. Janus Henderson's value has decreased from 5,217 in January to 4,522 in December. Its calendar year return was negative 13.31%, which underscored the rest of 2005, 230 basis points. The fund was overweight in real estate, financials, industrials, and materials while underweighted in conjugate discretionary, healthcare, information technology, and utilities. Financials were under pressure as bank reported weak loan growth and higher funding cost. Financials holdings held up better in some cases, which was driven by performance in some of their insurance holdings. Although stake selection in consumer staples and healthcare added relative returns our overweight allocations meant that the sectors were related to tractors. Now please turn to page 10. <coughs> our next one is Prime Cap ODC Aggressive Growth Fund. 
these funds, value has decreased from 10,170 in January to 9,465 in December. This fund had a calendar year return of negative 6.93%, which is strongly outperformed the Russell 2000 by 408 basis points. Strong results were generated from the overweightings in the healthcare, information technology, industrial, and discretionary as compared to the Russell 2000. Possible detractors from further positive results are financial, energy, and consumer staples. Now, please turn to page 11. As you remember from last year's meeting, we purchased Wasser's core growth fund in May 8th for $1,000. This gave us a calendar year return of negative 13.17% in 2018. This return underscored Russell 2000 benchmark by 216 basis points. This can be explained due to different asset allocation of our fund and the Russell 2000. The healthcare holdings contributed the most to performance related to the benchmark. Wasser's top holdings are industrials, information technology, consumer discretionary, and healthcare. After analyzing our mid to small cap funds, I found that prime cap ODC has been performing well compared to the benchmark as most of its holdings are in healthcare and information technology. The Wasser's core growth fund underperformed to our benchmark in 2018. It has a positive return in the first quarter of 2019. Our final fund, Janus Henderson, was not able to beat the benchmark as, of it, as most of its holdings is in financials. But the variance between the benchmark and the performance of our fund was by 230 basis points in 2018 and 63 basis points in first quarter of 2019. In one of the articles about financials sectors, I learned that it is not the right time for the investor to load the boat, but no, neither is the time to abandon the sea. As we know, value funds look for the stocks that are less expensive or growing more slowly than the market, Janus Henderson can create opportunities to accelerate earnings in the future. Therefore, I do not recommend buying or selling any of the mid to small cap funds. Now Blake will discuss about the international portion of our fund. Howdy. My name is Blake Smith and I'm the manager for the international portion of our portfolio. Currently there are five funds in, the, in our portfolio. Lotus International Market Master Fund, Fidelity Overseas Fund, FMI International Fund, iShares MSCI EFA Index Fund, and the Vanguard Emerging Market Fund. On page 12 you will see our first international fund, Lotus International, whose value has decreased from 4,142 in January of 2018 to 3,344 in December. <coughs> Lotus had a return of negative 19.27%, losing to the benchmark by 5.91%. 5 One reason for this could be their overenthusiastic sector weight in industrials, greatly surpassing the index industrial sector weight by 5.95%, and their underenthusiastic weight in financials which was 5.51% less than the index. Lotus, though, does have a cumulative return of 68.71% since inception. Lotus is led by a group of strong managers and advised by Charles Schwab, a group that we trust. They use a multi-manager strategy and is our large growth mutual fund. It focuses on the developed markets of Europe, including the UK and Japan, and it is heavily weighted in industrials, consumer discretionaries, and financials. Next on page 13 is FMI International Fund, which saw a return of negative 9.46%, outperforming the benchmark by 3.9%. The FMI International Fund seeks a long-term capital appreciation through the purchase of a limited number of large capitalization foreign value stocks. The fund extends the core philosophy of the management company, Fiduciary Management Incorporated, buying good businesses at value prices, investing in equity securities of companies, um, domiciles or headquarters outside the United States. On page 14 is Fidelity Overseas Fund. The fund ended last year with a value of 2,420, trailing the benchmark by 133 basis points. The poor performance may be attributed to the overweight in the financials, 
very similar to Lotus, Lotus holding more weight in the sector than the index by 4.54%. The fund seeks long-term growth of capital by investing at least 65% of total assets in foreign securities. Next on page 16 is iShares MSCI IFA ETF, or 15, sorry, on 15. The dollar value of our, of I, our iShares IFA holding decreased from 8,719 to 7,520 in December. iShares had a return of 13.8, losing to the benchmark, of negative 13.8, excuse me, losing to the benchmark by 44 basis points, but matching the MSCI and IFA returns exactly. iShares has 97.81% of their assets in non-US stocks. Finally, on page 16, is the Vanguard World Emerging Market Fund, um, which saw a return of negative 14.8%, losing to the benchmark by 144 points, but only losing to the MSCI Emerging Market Net Return USD by 20 basis points. This could be explained by Vanguard's sector weight in financials, surpassing the index by 5.09%, and greatly overweighing the index in, community ser in communication services by 8.58%. I have no recommendations in um, altering the portfolio at this time, and next will be Aaron Rostro to talk about our, our alternative portfolio. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Rostro. My responsibilities include managing the alternative sector. Currently we have five funds in this sector, two being mutual funds and three being exchange traded funds. The two mutual funds include T. Rowe Price Real Estate and Third Avenue Real Estate. Both are in the real estate sector and underperformed in comparison to their benchmark. The S&P 500 at negative 4.38%. All the remaining exchange rate funds but one underperformed the benchmark and vary in, in sectors like energy, technology, and healthcare. Please turn to page 17 where we'll begin talking about Third Avenue Real Estate returns at negative 19.91% compared to its benchmark MSCI, EFA, and RUSD that had a re return of negative 13.79%. The beginning value for the Third Avenue Real Estate Fund was at $5,826 and it ended at $4,666. They cited their largest source of negative performance to their exposure in the U.S. singles family housing industry. The economic uncertainty was also cited as a factor because it slowed the growth of construction and sales of new single-family houses in the U.S. Please turn to page 18 where we'll talk about T. Rowe Price Real Estate Report. Reported a return of negative 8.99% compared to the S&P 500, which had a return of negative 4.38%. Its beginning value was $3,895 and ended the past year at $3,544. The mutual fund's poor performance was due to news that the GGP, a top 10 holding, agreed to, merger, to merge at a price below long-term expectations, and another top 10 holding, Maserich, being viewed as a small acquisition candidate as well, having a high turn turnover in executives, including their CEO. To please turn to page 19, we'll begin talking about the exchange rate funds, starting with the Energy Select Fund. <coughs> the beginning value of the Energy Select Fund was $4,482, and then it decreased to an ending value of $2,744. The total return for the year is negative 18.2%, or oh, 20%, my bad, sorry. The fund also has a negative return since inception at negative 7.95%. Please turn to page 20, where we'll begin talking about our technology investment in Invesco S&P 500 <coughs> The beginning value for this exchange traded fund was $6,280 and $28, and it ended at a performance of negative, or I'm sorry, of $4,752. The total return for the year was at negative 0.6%, making it the only fund to outperform the S&P benchmark at negative point. 4.38%. The total returns in succession, inception was 57.53%. And to talk about our final exchange trade fund on page 21, we'll begin with the iShares U.S. Healthcare Providers. The beginning value for this fund was $4,535 in February of 2018. 
with an ending value of 4,625. The total return for the year and since its inception in the Smith was negative 17.4%. For recommendations this year, I will be advocating to decrease our holdings in 3rd Avenue Real Estate to put 3,011 to have the holdings at, for 3rd Avenue Real Estate be 3,111, there's a lot of ones at this one, $3,111, sorry, and put the 1,555 into T-Row. I'm suggesting this because T-Row has been more consistent than 3rd Avenue and has had temporary problems with their top 10 holdings that cause underperformance, whereas 3rd Avenue's performance seems to stem from management. Now, Alexis Pacino will discuss fixed income. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexis Pacino, and the center I manage is fixed income. Now, I will discuss the fixed income holdings, starting on page 22. For fixed income, we currently have two investments, Dodge and Cox Income Fund and Vanguard Ginnome Fund Investor Shares. The fixed income sector started out at $39,915 in January of 2018 and ended at $44,912 in December of 2018. The fixed income sector had a negative return of 0.22%. If you haven't already, please turn to page 22. Uh, Dodge and Cox started out at $36,611 in January and ended with $41,590 in December of 2018. Dodge and Cox didn't do terribly against the benchmark, but underperformed by 34 basis points. Dodge and Cox is currently operating with an effective duration of 4.3 years and has a cumulative return since inception of 88.29%. Now, if you could please turn to page 23, and I will discuss the last one. The Vanguard Jim May Fund started, started the year with a value of $3,304 and ended the year off with $3,332. The, the fund outperformed the benchmark by 86 basis points. It's given its cumulative return since inception was 10.94%, and the average duration of the fund was 3.6 years. After looking into the, into the fund's historical returns and having the pleasure to receive suggestions from various portfolio managers, it is recommended to not add or remove any funds from, from the fixed income sector of the student management investment fund. In summary, our, our, our large cap portfolio manager recommended that we sell Selective American and use the proceeds to purchase T-Row Price Blue Chip. As for our international portfolio manager, he says otherwise, he recommends that no change should be made. Our alternative manager suggests that we decrease Third Avenue Real Estate and increase the T-Row price of real estate. As you heard from our small cap manager, we are not recommending any changes to the mid-small cap. In addition, as you heard from me, we are not recommending any changes to our fixed income holdings. As you can see in our composition and allocation slide, our actual results fall within our ranges from every category except alternative. Also, fixed income is slightly underweighted at 24.8% compared to our minimum of 25%. In March, the class attended the Global Asset Management Education Investment Forum in New York City. The Seminary College Student Government Association provided 3900 for the trip, and we needed to sell 5100 of the Smith to cover for the remaining expenses of the form. Blake, would you change the slide? Yeah. Thank you. 
For the first quarter of 2019, the Smith Fund had earned a return of 10.46% compared to the benchmark return of 9.91%. The equity portfolio generated a return of 12.9% and the fixed income portfolio had a return for the same time period of 3.56%. Would you try to slide, please? back one, please. These numbers are not in your report. That's why I wanted you to be able to see them clearly. Now we want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend the Student Management Investment Fund meeting. We, are, we greatly appreciate it. Okay, so the rest of the pages in your booklet the written report includes the quarterly statements that have been sent to you electronically after every quarter. But we put those always at the end of the report so that you also have uh, in the same place you have that information. So that concludes the student presentation. I would like to invite you now to enjoy your salad. And then I think the food is already should be. Okay, so whenever you're ready, uh, please. Uh, make yourself welcome to go to the back and get your plate of food. And then um, we'll have, we still have, it's only 11.54, so we still have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So please enjoy your lunch for a few minutes, and then as uh, you have questions and all, we can sort of have that discussion. Okay? Thank you. So you're graduating? Yes, sir. And where, what's the next? Are you using? Yeah, um, we're going to go back to Dallas from, 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 from Plano, Texas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I plan to actually um, work at a 
Favorite Rudy. And I remember the time we were like, you know, Salt Lake. Getting Yeah, it's a good 
this is the worst of the So how did y'all do it in your uh, <laughs> Centenary, 20 years ago. It just seems like the other day. I know it. 
Utah, 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 Utah,
Yeah. Well, the shopper main campus was our market for it. And over time, they reoriented it more toward mm -hmm. Fairfield, and so it would address the St. Mary's place. And they, you know, they invested a fortune in the children's hospital. Um, but the, you know, the population went south, but the insured population went south. And so, you know, Will Snyder was basically captured his ear at the Interrogate location and shut the head off. So they just basically shut down the whole facility for the church. And they to the island of the hospital. So all their construction turned down there. So, I mean, it's being you know, I knew when, uh, when Bill Comich is right assigned an audit that it was something was a good thing. I tried to sell it. I didn't make them, and I'm not sure he did work for a good family. I was sure that it was a good thing. Chris was a good thing. No, I was just trying to throw it all. I don't want to have goggles on the other side of the ring. I didn't want to go away. I traveled too much. I know what you're going to do. I'm not going to do it. No, it's still the right. I'll tell you what, I've lost it. You said you still have to have a look. So to try to make it a little more customer friendly, so it's a
move forward from that point, if that's okay with everybody here. We did have a meeting in March, and many of you were able to come for a committee, we call it a committee meeting, and we met during class very informally. And I think we're going to try to continue that because it worked out so well. Thank you, Nick Seal, for my recommendation. I think we'll keep doing that and, and as we move forward. So at this time, I'm not the answer of the questions. And I'm just standing up here to, to get things going. But if you have any questions uh, for our group, I know one has to leave um, what, about 10 minutes, Alex. So if you have any fixed income uh, comments or questions, Alex is going to run off uh, and meet up with someone. So fair game. Yes, sir. Go. One, one comment that is unknown. We look at yearly quarterly stuff, but since 2004, the Smith has had a compound return of 40 basis points of its benchmark. Mm -hmm. Those in the business, that's pretty, that's pretty tough. Yeah. You can go back and see your track of errors, 40 basis points since 2004. So, congratulations. Thank you. Very Can much. I follow up on that, though? Uh, a question for, I, I guess, for Scott, because it's something. Uh, follow up on something you said. Uh, benchmarks are designed to be hard to beat. Mm -hmm. and that's the first time I've heard that. So I wonder if you can tell me a little more about that. So um, I guess I should. Um, so kind of the the idea behind that is when you think of uh, what kind of benchmarks we have, we have these these indexes that are put together by a lot of very very intelligent people on. on in the financial area around around the country, and uh, the reason it's there's designed to be hard to beat is because there's there's they're supposed to be kind of the baseline that you want to look at. Those are the stock the stocks that are in, for instance, the S and P 500, the Nasdaq uh, Composite Index. When, when you look at those stocks, those are not going to be typically stocks that you and I have never heard of. You're, they're going to typically be the safer, more put together stocks, and they're also going to depending on which index you're looking at. Some of them are going to take risks and, and try having a few that are going to grow. But I mean, uh, Apple, I don't think was put into uh, one one of the uh, into one of those indexes until they were around and selling the iPhone for like three years and that. That was only one of the hugest uh, So with that argument, we wanted to ask what a better index instead of S and P 500. Better in the sense that more. Uh, accurately reflected the broader market be something like the Russell, whatever it is, 2000, or, or one of the one of indexes. Yeah. I'm sorry, no, just in general. Uh, in general, uh, I think it, it depends on, on what uh, type of holdings you have. I think, uh, I know for the large cap sector, I think the S&P 500 is, is a good benchmark to have because they're uh, mostly major they're, they're majority stocks, all of the funds in there. Uh, they all are in large cap, they're all going to be those same bigger companies that you would expect to be in, in an index like the S&P 500. Um, so it seems like a fair comparison point. Um, the, the point of saying it's hard to beat is being a few points off isn't the end of the world. If you're way off the benchmark, then that's that's when it, you start to look at it and you try to. Scott, explain about our 55, 15, 30. The, uh, the so for our benchmark, our composite. So for our. Uh, with that said, we do have a composite benchmark for the overall Smith to try being more representative of the holdings that we have across all of the different categories, uh, which, um, as I, I mentioned before, is a 55% S&P 500 uh, to try covering the, the majority stocks part, 30% uh, MSCI EFA, and 15% Barclay Bank. 15%? Yeah, MSCI is 15. MSCI is 15, sorry. It's 70-30 equity and fixed income. So we pull out that 15 for the MSCI. But also remember, Arvind had used the Russell 2000 when she was doing her part of the portfolio. The mid to small, even though our investment policy statement says the S&P 500. And also Aaron used some other benchmarks based on what Morningstar suggests for some of those ETFs and all. So it may not have been quite as clear as, as they understand it because they had to deal with it so much. But we are we are using like the main benchmark, but we're also looking at those that might be more appropriate for one part, rather than just say blanket it has to be this one. And so it's it's not exactly as clear maybe in, in their 
what they were presenting here, like I said, haven't lived it as much as they have in the last few months. <laughs> I want to hear what some of the professionals have to say about the the mid cap, um, the mid to small cap um, team recommended to hold. But what are, what would be your thoughts of condensing some of our three funds down to two? Because one of those has not kept up with the other two since. Everybody, Janice, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Arvina went back and forth. She really did. Yeah. I know she did. And her first thing was, let's get rid of it. And then she, I guess she just, you know, had that yeah. attachment or something. <laughs> and then changed her mind. So. I just know Vanguard has the lower expense ratio. And some of the others have been traditionally more closely aligned with their benchmark. And what, is, what do some of our big guns in the room think <laughs> do this for a living that we don't? Everybody, but just, you know, I'll be honest with you, I like the iShares because it follows a similar philosophy as the Vanguard lower expense ratio to product certification. I think it's IGH is the one that I use. Well, I mean, like I was looking at Henderson. I mean, they've consistently been about 10 percent. Uh huh. So, so, Mr. Seal wanted to know who was managing it. How long have you been in, in that position? Do you remember? I don't exactly remember. She had it in her spreadsheet, but yeah. right now I, I don't remember either. Okay. But it was definitely more than five years. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the exact number. I don't know. It just seemed like we had too much in too many places to be able to capture increases in responses and value. Hey, Nine years? Had it for nine years? Uh, we had it, yeah. How long have we had Janice? About so 11, 2010. Mm -hmm. yeah, one, one dollar and one dollar and ninety cents to the dollar over ten years versus what the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Figured out. But I think when you have change, you have a conviction behind why. And if that's a strong enough conviction, then you pull the trigger and you, you move on. Yeah. So then you can go back and forth and, you know, is this one going to be better? I don't know. I don't know. Feel convicted about it. Pull the trigger and go. I was trying to figure out what your balance between growth and value was. So it looks like you're making a significant growth investment with your recommendation. I was trying to add them all up. I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, we need Excel to help us do that, don't we? Pull out those dollars. I do. <laughs> I do too. I do too. But, I mean, I do remember the one year the fund really had a rough year. The group the year before totally committed the next group to growth, mm -hmm. and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it you know, then you guys get to have a really bad year reporting bad numbers. Um, so, you know, you're you're a moment in time. There will be somebody after you, and be careful you don't tie their hands. Yeah. I have kind of a similar question to that one too. Um, probably for Blake. Um, would it be more helpful? Uh, not more helpful. Wouldn't we also, when we looked at our international holdings, in addition to seeing them divided up by sector, wouldn't it also be helpful to present uh, geographical distribution? So, uh, so like which countries in particular foreignly are doing well? Right. So, we could, you know, I'm, I'm an international political economist by training, so I think about these things a little bit. You know, a lot of the international funds that I'm familiar with are really heavily weighted into uh, the developed world and the EU, you know, we, we own VWO, which is obviously emerging markets, 
in emerging markets change over time? And we have done a little bit of reading and education on like what really qualifies as an emerging market, because uh, you are correct, there's people define even sometimes um, China as an emerging market, and that's been very, that's far from, there's a wide spectrum of it. But um, to answer your question, I think most of ours seem to be just off memory in UK, Japan, and that kind of stuff. So it probably would be good to just see where in particular, but I believe mostly it's in very developed countries like the UK, Japan, and um, there's a third one I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, because you know, in the same way that if you're not careful, if you buy a bunch of different funds, but they all own the same underlying holdings, mm -hmm. that can happen in the international field too, especially some of these international funds that say they're international, but they've got 50% of the exactly. stocks. Yeah, yeah so. I believe most of ours have a lot of stock, have a lot of their holdings in foreign, so we don't have a lot of that situation. But we have a lot of our stuff in very developed countries. Well, we have. Um, Is she? Oh, she's got the Charles Schwab. Okay. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I have the Morning Star reports. Of course. Yeah, we have. We have definitely Europe developed is, mm -hmm. is the majority holding for loudest, and then uh, United Kingdom. There's a good percentage in North America, and at the moment, remember we have. Very small amounts. You know, when you look at the total value of what we have, uh, FMI is what only about two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars. Yeah, it's fifteen hundred. So you know, when you, when you say twenty-five percent invest in North America, it's not very much money, you know, overall. And then um, Fidelity is fifty-two percent in Europe and UK. Right. So, so the question is right. I mean, I realize I'm probably the least experienced and least knowledgeable person in the room, but uh, you know, the reason you hold international holdings is because you're not correlated with domestic holdings. If you end up heavily in the EU, you're going to lose some of that advantage, right? Well, yeah, again, it's 20% in $2,000. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, yeah, that. Absolutely. But so you, we, have to, do, you always have to ask the question: Why are you in international holdings, and are your investments doing what you want to for that? I don't want to give the students the answer, but I mean, remember what I do on the board the other day? The frontier. The future frontier. And what happens when you add international? It make it. This point is correlation. Right. Exactly. Mark what was, we, Mark what we do run. Mark says, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, yeah. and so that lack of space out of phase will give you greater return for a risk budget for, you know, yeah. for your return of less risk. And we do in run theory. the correlations between all of the, the funds that we have in the and the ones that we're thinking about. There's an interesting thing I found out by talking to one of the managers of the emerging markets. And and that is, they can't have very much of their funds in the emerging markets, <laughs> just simply because they have a liquidity issue. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. you'll see maybe 50% of a, like Oppenheimer developing markets funds got to have some EFA experience, exposure just for liquidity if they get it. And I thought that was interesting. Well, as far as international goes, you always have your FX exposure to sure. Brexit. China price price fixing. I mean, so even if you do have some correlation on large cap stocks, you have FX exposure. Sure. Well, you've got the angel fund in there, and your your initial return was 100 uh, percent, but you it's very illiquid, and you won't really have a return for years. So it's got to well, be really. We hard. don't have that, George. That yeah. that that's sitting there. Okay. That was a so we made a distribution made to this to the college, and the college made the distribution to the angel fund. Even though it came from the Smith, we are not in our we're not legally okay. allowed in our IPS to have it. So we are not going to get any any return that comes from that will go to the college, not to the Smith. Yeah. 
Okay. A harder term. Let me, let me go a little bit of advertising here. Uh, the softer term, which is the skills that our students are getting by participating in that teaching fund, flows directly to the School of Business. Well, Arkana uh, was one of the students, and then Charlie Albritton, who is a business major, was the other student that participated all year in the Angel Fund meetings with Dr. Sykes and Dr. LeBach. So, so did you find that helpful? Yeah, it was I found them very interesting when I got to go last summer before we, before we let the students go. Mm -hmm. but. but she's been to many, many meetings this whole year, right? You and Charlie, so. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. I mean, uh, no, no, absolutely. Let's shut the time. One of my hobbies yeah. is uh, visual presentation of quantitative data. Uh, I'm curious about the decision to have different uh, y axes on all of your return uh, charts. They vary from page to page. They vary. That would be page. me. That would be me. I did, I did that. So, you know. And, and if, if I'm told it's industry standard, that's fine. It just it, it always raises a little bit of a red flag. You mean like me. the dates? No, the percentages on the total returns. Oh, that was just because of the uh, variation. You know, some went. Some went between 2% and negative 2%, and one went between 20 and negative 20. So the ranges on the horse, on the uh, vertical axis, I just I just randomly picked those. Do you think that helps or hurts the ability to draw comparisons across pages? I'm not. I, I don't really know the purpose of doing that because I, honestly, again, I would have to look at the uh, proportion to the portfolio as to that. Uh, return because we're looking at you know one that has like Dodge and Cox that has thirty thousand dollars in it versus um, you know an ETF that has well you have you have a mid cap that has barely a thousand right mm -hmm. so I don't know I, I mean I you know I debate on that because even sometimes on page to page when you're comparing it with that return I had to explode the um, range for the vertical axis to make the return fit, just, just to make no, I understand. Right. I understand why. I just, yeah. I, and again, it's sort of a kind of philosophical question. You know, if I'm as as sort of not, as a non-expert, if I'm thumbing through these pages, yeah, it looks like all the investments perform about the same because the graphs about the same. You know, because you've because you've normed you've normed the 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 vertical axis essentially. So. Uh, well, yeah, if I'm just going to thumb through, if we hadn't done it that way, I might thumb through this and find it. And I'm not going to do it right now. One of them only declined, you know, two yeah. percent, and the other one declined twenty percent, but they look the same on this graph. That's that's my only point. Maybe maybe it's a non-point, but it doesn't look more hard on the expanded contrast the graphs based on the amount of return. I guess it's kind of. It's not fixed. Yeah, these are create. I, you know, these are just create. Okay, I'm holding this normal talk. Yeah, yeah. Based on the timeline, so. Yeah, yeah. Maybe see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got one more. Yeah. That is not a good enough. <laughs> 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 we, we could do a whole page all of that. Put every single yeah. return for every single investment on one big graph. That would be a good visual. I've never done that, but yeah. Time I do have one question. question, and this is just out of curiosity. I know occasionally I run concentration risk with regards to portfolios because you have a lot of your large caps. Uh, so I'm curious if you run uh, analysis to see the investments within those funds, what they actually are, the, and find out if there's any particular company that's sort of way in that area. And therefore, if it is, do you evaluate that company as well? You mean the, you mean the mutual fund company? The mutual funds are the ETFs. So for example, information technology usually has Apple. Yeah. So you just look and see which funds have Apple, what percentage it is, mm -hmm. how much press does that have. Yeah, the students can speak to this. But yes, as part of the class, they are evaluating what we already have. And then they're expanding to look at all the other options that are available that we can invest through, through Charles Schwab. And so that's one of the most important things is to look at the top 10 holdings and compare. And we talk about, you know, if A is the same as B, then, you know, why do you want B? I mean, so they have to 
they have to go through all that process as part of the semester. Yeah. And again, they can speak to it if they want. Any other questions? Thank you again so much for coming. And um, if you have any recommendations for board members that you would like to join us with, if you could shoot me an email and you can see because we can always welcome another board member or two. We've lost, we've lost three this last year. Who did we lose? Um, Dennis and DeVore resigned last April. And then Ellen resigned when she became a board member of the college. So we, we had three that were normally here, but um, not anymore. So if you have any names, that would be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you very much. We all do for you to be here. Thank you. Good job.